Good evening and welcome. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, and this is the best in paranormal talk radio five days a week. That's right now, five days a week here on PodcastOne.com. You can also find us and subscribe to us on iTunes. And if you are an iTunes subscriber, please do us a big favor. Make sure you rate and review the show and let people know about it because the more rates and reviews we get, the higher it'll go up, the more people will be alerted to the show, and we will continue to spread the darkness. And our army of darkness will continue to grow. I want to thank everybody for being a part of the show with us, tuning in every night now as we go five nights a week as we're part of the Jericho Network here on Podcast One. Timmy D still has the week off. Uh, he has been dealing with a, a, a bad illness and a small infection that he's trying to beat back. So he should be back in full rare form with us next week. Uh, got great shows lined up for you, though. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking with one of my favorite guests, Neil Story. And I know I keep saying my favorite guest, but he truly is among the higher echelon. He's written over 40 books. He is um, a paranormal investigator and a researcher and a historian and uh, an amazing storyteller. As a matter of fact, Neil is going to be joining us on our British Invasion Tour. Darkness Radio will be invading England in September 2017. We'll be going along with some of our listeners as we go through and hear all of the haunted tales and history of England. And we'll be going all over, visiting uh, famous locations and uh, famous sites and famous haunts throughout the entire countryside. And we'd love for you to join us. You can get more information by checking darknessevents.com in the next few days or email me. And as soon as the information is available, I'll make sure we email it out to you. Email me dave at darknessradio.com, dave at darknessradio.com, and Neil will be on board for the entire trip, which is about a week-long trip out to England where we will tour all over the countryside. We'll get a chance to visit some of the most famous places, some of the most great haunts, and uh, we'd love for you to be a part of that with us. So again, email me for more information, which should be available relatively soon here. You can email me dave at darknessradio.com. Dot com. Tomorrow, Joshua P. Warren will join us. We're going to talk about tulpas, thought forms, and is there something to us setting an intention? Can we create paranormal experiences simply by thinking about them, giving them energy, creating them, much like we talked about the Slender Man issue a few weeks ago, by giving something power and attention, does it make it happen? Does it make it strong? We'll talk with Joshua P. Warren, who has some amazing stories to share with us from his own research, and we'll do that tomorrow on Beyond the Darkness. Right now, though, Neil is our guest. We're going to talk about his book, The Little Book of Death, which is a great book. It's It's got intriguing, um, fascinating, and very obscure, strange, and entertaining facts that he's culled together into one tome talking about death, everything from body snatchers to uh, talking about twisted and strange ghost hauntings, and we're going to do that throughout this evening's show. So, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time on Beyond the Darkness, Mr. Neil Story. Neil, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello there, Dave. Good to be with you. It is great to hear you, and uh, boy, this is a bit of Dave vu. It feels like we've been here before, Neil, and uh, <laughs> I, I love having you be a part of our family, and it's great to bring you over from Darkness Radio now to Beyond the Darkness so that uh, our new listeners all around the world can get familiar with you as well. We'll have a link up to Neil's website and more information so you can find out about him and his 40 books. But let's start off. The, the Little Book of Death uh, most of us are fascinated by the idea of death. What happens when we die? Where we go when we die? And as TV has proven with uh, Stupid Ways to Die and uh, documentaries about um, the most bizarre death encounters and things like that, people are fascinated with uh, learning about death, learning about obscure facts uh, throughout history of the way death has been handled. Um, and, and that's what we're going to cover during this show. Uh, one, one thing, though, I've always been curious about, Neil, is the idea yeah. of body snatching. Because you know, we, <laughs> we visited on one of our Darkness Radio uh, tours two years ago. We went to Scotland. And, mm. boy, we, you know, we visited Greyfriar Cemetery. We visited some of the, the beautiful cemeteries out there. And the stories of grave robbing were incredible. But what Absolutely. I found, yeah, what I found the most bizarre, though, Neil, is the fact that the laws and the rules for grave robbing don't really seem to match up with what we'd think they would be. Um, maybe you can give us a small introduction, by the way, of two of the most famous uh, grave robbers, Burke and Hare. Can you tell us a little bit about who these two guys are and and why was it so prevalent at that time to steal bodies from graves? Mm, well, in the 18th century, with the 
advances in medical knowledge. For the first time, we were able to cut up bodies for uh, medical knowledge and the advancement of medical knowledge. And so anatomy schools where gentlemen could send their sons to learn the art of the surgeon were set up all across Great Britain. One of them was set up in Edinburgh uh, by quite a dandy, uh, Mr. Knox, the surgeon, uh, beautifully portrayed in the film Burke and Hare, starring Simon Pegg and, and, and Andy Serkis. They played Burke and Hare. Uh, and he was a dandy, he was a character. He would always operate and demonstrate with a real flourish. These men, the surgeons of the early 19th century and late 18th century, they made an awful lot of money. So people like Astley Cooper in London had a reputation, uh, the, the Hunter brothers had a reputation that they could get literally any body. But if, there was, if there was a reputation and people knew about this, Neil, how was it acceptable? Why were the law... Uh, why wasn't the law on top of these guys all the time? Well, it's like a lot of things, particularly in the Victorian age, that if it is out of sight, it is out of mind. And these men would literally bring the bodies in via the back door of the teaching hospitals and surgeons' halls all across Great Britain. The law had never had to deal with anything quite like that. <laughs> So it struggled. It struggled to find a way of prosecuting these men because when a body is dead in British law, it doesn't belong to anybody apart from God. So if God makes a, a case against these men, you know, brings a lawsuit, then, then they could prosecute. <laughs> so, so all they could rely on really was, was what laws disturbing the peace. Uh, if the you, you know, what could you do? It breaking and entering into a coffin. It, it, these were paltry offences uh, that they could prosecute them on for committing what is really a, a, a heinous crime of, of desecrating and robbing a grave. Burke and Hare. Right. It was uh, almost. It was almost. Even though it was a heinous crime, it was almost expected at some point, wasn't it? That that you're. You know, a fresh body was going to be dug up and and uh, there was a great possibility that your loved one was going to be stolen. It was a, a real fear across Great Britain. The body had to be fresh. Uh, a body that has decomposed is is it, it's it's pu pu it literally putrefies. It smells bad. It's rotted. It, it it's everything starts to liquidate. So it it's no good on, on a surgeon's table at all. It has to be fresh. So yes, people were afraid. So they would pay. Uh, members of the watch or people who would uh, be a sort of watchman on, in the graveyard. In some graveyards, there are still extant in Great Britain watch houses that people would sit in overnight to make sure that the graves were not robbed. You know, they have some old boy with a blunderbuss. And there are many, many stories of the robbers coming along. They're being chased off and the guy fires at them. It was a real fear. So how are we going to cope with it? Well, whenever there is a need, often there are inventors that will create things in response to that need. For example, they, they were iron-bound coffins. You'd get a blacksmith in who'd make very heavy and solid iron bands all around the coffin to make sure that it's put in the grave and it cannot be easily broken into. There were special safety co coffins created that were supposedly uh, robber-proof, or at least they would be. They would not make the job very easy for the grave robbers at all. There were even uh, cages uh, which had long prongs, rather like a uh, arc over, and these long metal prongs would go deep into the ground, which would make digging into the ground and, and to 
extract the coffin uh, nigh on impossible. They're very heavy. And, and some of these uh, cradles or, or cages, as they are known, uh, still exist. You can still see them in churchyards today. And indeed, the Victorians carried on that theme by often placing a little metal uh, surround with, with spikes on it uh, around the grave. So again, you, you can't easily uh, get in and dig down because it made it too narrow for the grave robbers to operate. And you'll still see those in existence in churchyards today. I'm curious, you know, as you do all of this uh, research into history, Neil, looking at mm. ghost stories and tales of uh, witches or vampires, uh, do you believe that that was a way for, A, the family to try to dissuade body snatchers from going into these cemeteries? Or perhaps it was perpetuated by the body snatchers to keep other interested parties from going into these cemeteries? Uh, because I know a lot of the stories we've heard, you know, that, that had these kind of bound uh, coffins and these uh, these coffins with gates and and heavy metal put over them. It seemed that they were trying to keep something from getting out of the coffin, as opposed to keeping grave robbers from getting into it. Do you think that this this kind of weird history came together to create these? mythological characters of wraiths and vampires and witches in order to just protect the bodies of the loved ones? There is nothing like a good ghost story right. uh, that seems to be authentic and terrifying and with co a ghost that has consequences if it confronts you it will carry you down to hell or you will die or go mad you know within a short period of time so they're very good for keeping people away smugglers were also very keen to promote those sort of uh, stories so that they could carry out their grim business after dark but the law of the risen dead is far more ancient than the, the body snatchers. And in, in British law and certain areas of Europe, you can trace the pinning of bodies back to very, very early times indeed, to the Middle Ages and indeed before. The case was, you see, that it was commonly accepted that if it was a stranger to your town, if somebody dies in mysterious circumstances of a mystery illness, or if they are accused of witchcraft, found guilty and executed. In England, we did not tend to burn witches. Uh, witches would be hanged by the neck until they be dead if they were found guilty of witchcraft. If you commit a murder via witchcraft, which was often a, a sort of cover name if you've poisoned somebody and killed them uh, and they couldn't sort of detect the poisons that would be murdered by witchcraft and if it's your nearest and dearest well that's a petty treason offence and so that person would face a petty treason penalty of being burnt at the stake. So that's why that sort of witches and burning at the stake uh, becomes uh, a bit of a blurred line there. So Imagine it. You've got this mysterious death in your town. Maybe it could be uh, a, a contagious disease. Uh, it was a, mis a person that was new to the area, a person they didn't trust, or an executed witch. Then you remove that person from your community. If somebody's got a contagious disease, then that, that makes sense. Right. But for others, the suicides, witches and mysterious characters, they're also taken out to at least a forkways or a crossroads. Now, the reason for that was because if they do rise up, in those days there was very little signage on the roads, and so they wouldn't know which way to go back into the village, because apparently it was very easy to confuse a spirit. And of course, the symbolism of being buried underneath a crossroads or crossway uh, it, it's the christian cross that helps keep that spirit down so the body would be buried by the sexton as the at sunset often people would come and watch this act was carried out into the 1830s so it's it's not a long long distant thing that this was still going on and the body would be placed into the grave and even into the 1830s a stake would be hammered through their heart now that's then maybe that the person had been thought of 
They, maybe there's a vampire legend at all, attached to that person, a suspicion. But the majority of cases are these suicides, mysterious deaths or witches, and they are pinned to the ground with a wooden stake because the heart, you see, is seen as the repository of the soul. So the soul will stay down. You will literally pin them into the ground and bury them there at that crossways and hopefully they would stay down forevermore and it's well attested that you know when they put the the railways through great britain the old engineers used to have to note some of the things that they, they found along the way and william marriott who put it was the great engineer of the, the midland and great northern railway there were numerous accounts in his diary and it seems that whenever they went through a crossways in the countryside that there were bodies buried at the crossways often with remnants of stakes either wooden or even iron through their heart so it's not surprising that the kind of notion of uh, pinning graves keeping graves safe that law and legend will amalgamate with 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 the vampire legend and 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 suspicions of vampires when we're trying to keep people safe in their grave from body snatchers was it the body snatchers who would go in to retrieve these bodies to sell for medical science were they the ones that were finding um, people that have been clawing at the inside of their coffin because perhaps they weren't officially really dead at that point. Uh, was that more of what was going on, and were they the ones that were perpetuating the story of the living dead? Now, that's an interesting thought. I think those who were the body snatchers, they wouldn't care what they were finding when they went down there. They had little or no conscience at all. But when right, but I would the, still think the superstitious part of them, as they open up a grave and see that there's oh, claw it. marks or maybe blood trickling from the mouth and the, the face looking freshly bloated as though perhaps it just you know gorged itself on, on human blood somewhere, mm. that would be terrifying. It would be terrifying, but remember they're working in very, very low light. They carry what they call dark lanthorns, which are not glazed. They actually have horn in them that the light shines through. So you wouldn't see an awful lot of that. The the legends of and and indeed the true stories of bodies being found with clawed uh, coffin roofs that that does exist, and that comes from times when there have been epidemic diseases from things from cholera, smallpox, various epidemics that will strike towns and villages, and bodies would be put into pest houses or nailed up into their houses. A lot of the medical people would flee away from those areas, leaving maybe a local rector, uh, a man of God, or what they used to call, in our neck of the woods, uh, Grill more, there's big women that had worked for years with their husbands who were the night men or the honey cart drivers and the not or gong farmers. Now, they're all names of men that would work emptying necessary houses, the privy down the garden. And these families of dung carters would be exposed regularly to all of the uh, little bites of pecks of dirt as they used to call it, the pecks of dirt that would cause all sorts of diseases, and they'd become immune to it. So often the, those families would survive. In London, those that worked in the drains were known as the toshers, and they would often survive the epidemics when many others would fall. So these people were not medically trained. One infamous story that loiters around in a number of the pest houses, these grill northers that were working in those, uh, that they, they get the bodies, they look dead, and so they'd put them into coffins. Coffins were expensive, and often, you know, bodies would be just tipped into a, a big pit with lime put on the top. But if you've got the coffin, that's from a decent family. They may have even used that box as the bed for the person as they were dying from that horrible illness. And they would nail it down. And nails were also expensive. You couldn't go to your local Walmart or DIY store and, and, and buy nails. They had to be made by a blacksmith. So they were expensive. So you can imagine it. These people, he looks dead, put him in the box, nail him up, and then all of a sudden you get, oh, oh, let me out, let me out. And they'd look at each other and say, he's going to die anyway, and leave him to it. 
And that's why you end up with these scratch marks on, on the lids of the coffins. So years later, when they're putting through roadways, railroads, or developing the areas, uh, they would go through these plague pits and uncover these coffins. And, and the same thing would happen in crypts underneath churches. If it was a family of nobility, or if they've got a charnel house where there's a lot of bodies in there, in coffins, that you know, you're going to change it, you're going to clear it out, you will find them occasionally with these scratched lids. And that would be, you know, they would have proper light, there would be people legitimately clearing these areas, and that is why those stories, they are terrifying, they are very real, and they would be told publicly, rather than just being the hushed words of the body snatchers. There had to be some kind of weird rules in effect, too, for what hospitals wanted, right? I mean, they certainly they didn't want infected bodies with cholera or black plague or any of the other weird mm. diseases of the time. How could they determine whether they were getting that or somebody who just died of a heart attack or, you know, uh, some other normal method of death? Well, you ha if there is no sign of illness on the body when it arrives, then you have to believe that it's okay. If, if it is a time of, of epidemic, then they would be very wary of, of accepting bodies, and probably the anatomy school would close during that period or be very careful where they got their bodies from rather than the more nefarious suppliers. You could normally tell if, if the body has been robbed from a grave, for example. The body snatchers knew that an anatomist does not need teeth. And so the bodies would be brought in and they would be robbed of their teeth, uh, pulled up by pliers, because the, the teeth could be sold to people that would work in dentistry making dentures. They used to call them dead man's teeth. Ugh. And around the, the time of Waterloo, they were paying women of the night of coastal areas of Great Britain to go over to France onto the battlefields, where many of the dead just lay in the open, unburied. Uh, and they, they would, you know, go and find the, the bodies and look for good teeth, no black worm in it, uh, in the mouth, kick the head open, and, or kick it with your, with your foot on the upper jaw. Uh, and then remove the teeth, and they'd come back with sacks of teeth for for the dental makers. Yeah. Not very wow. pleasant. No, holy <laughs> gosh! And people are complaining about their jobs, right? This is uh, <laughs> a different time and era. How did they determine which bodies were worth what, though? I mean, you know, it was was there an interest in getting some of the bodies with the plague, or or bodies like John Merrick, the Elephant Man, was to find deformities or? oddities mm. of the bodies was would there be an interest in that or did they want to avoid those kind of things it's absolutely verboten we don't want plague bodies or anything that can spread a contagious disease so that's completely out if the body shows signs of murder they ain't going to want it, really. And that was the demise of Burke and Hare, that rather than going into the grim business of digging up graves, uh, Burke had a lodging house with his so-called wife, and, and they had an old guy there. He owed them a lot of money, and he died. He died, and they took his body to Knox, their friendly local surgeon in Edinburgh, and they sold it, and they made about a tenner. And ten pounds, you know, it's the majority of a year's wages for an ordinary labouring man in the 1820s. Wow. So it's really good money. And their problem was that in the lodging house, they would soon find out who are the, the people that won't be missed. Who are those that haven't got any family? And, and so, you know, once they've bled them of the money for the rent, then they would hasten them on their way. Uh, that was what became known as burking because they got caught in the end. Uh, and there was the infamous case of the London Burkers as well. They all ended up being caught. And, the, and you know, Burke, uh, on the evidence of William Hare, his partner in crime, Hare turned King's evidence and sold Burke down, and, and he ended up on the gallows. And he was hanged for, for murder, not for body snatching. Uh, but the term of stealing a body became known as burking. And you get the cases of the London Burkers, Burking, Body Snatching, Resurrectionists. You'll find it all across Great Britain supplying the anatomy hospitals and surgical teaching schools. So what, what do, let's get down to brass tacks. 
what's a body worth? Well, you can normally get between five and ten pounds for a body. So that, that in those days, that was really good money. For a good specimen, they, they would like people with very good muscle structure. They would certainly go for that. That would be a top-rate one. So sometimes uh, in people that worked in heavier industries, smugglers tended to be, and sailors, those that worked regularly in, in that sort of environment, quite muscly, good muscle tone. And that's why in one of the London teaching hospitals, they've still got this uh, remarkable figure of a, of a man with his skin flayed from his body to show the veins and the muscle structure. And he is known as Smugglerius because he was once a smuggler. So prime specimens, that gets the top dollar. Babies, they are only a pound. But if you are a person in in those days if you were a person with a, a deformity or if you were very short if you were a, a person that uh, in those days they would describe them as a midget or a somebody with dwarfism they'd call them a dwarf um, or if you were very tall they'd call you a giant or if you were particularly um, obese um, by our standards in the modern world you'll see people of that size every day of your life but in those days and an obese person, and a very obese person, say 22, 25, 30 stone, was very unusual. And if you were one of those folks, and you went around the country earning your living, displaying yourself, and you fell ill, then the doctor's men would start loitering around, asking the people coming and going, does he look like he's going to survive or not? Because believe you me, the doctors and the surgeons, people like Astley Cooper and the Hunter brothers, uh, the founders of the Hunterian Museum in, in London, uh, would certainly be very interested and would pay handsomely for the most unusual specimens. Burn, the Irish giant, was particularly frightened that his body would end up in the hands of the anatomists. And so he paid more than one executor, quite a handsome amount of money, his life savings he left to them to make sure that his body would be placed in a coffin, weighted with stones and taken to a great lake and tossed over the side uh, so that no body snatchers could get hold of it. Well, Mr. Hunter had rather more money, and it cost him a small fortune to bribe the executors that were supposedly going to carry out Mr. Burns' last wishes. And so a coffin, weighted with stones, was indeed dropped into the middle of a great lake. But within the month, a very tall skeleton of giant proportions was put on display wired together in the Hunterian Museum. Dot, dot, dot. Wow, nobody was safe. Even the rich <laughs> weren't safe from getting that uh, that kind of abuse. Uh, we need to take a quick break. Our guest, Neil Story, The Little Book of Death. We're talking about some strange, fascinating, obscure facts regarding death. We'll also weave in some very strange and unusual ghost stories throughout the show. We'll do that when we return. You're listening to the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. And we're back here on Beyond the Darkness. Listen, if you like what you hear on the show and you'd like to know more about our guests and their research, you'd like to go find the books, the documentaries, the films that we discuss right here, well, here's something really cool that you can do that'll help Darkness Radio's Beyond the Darkness continue to live on here at Podcast One. If you visit our page at Podcast One, you'll see the link for Killer Deals. Killer Deals. Click on that link. And then that will take you to our advertisers page. If you click on the Amazon link, which you can click on the Canadian, the British, or the American flag, you'll be able to uh, order from the store in your area. And using that link, every purchase you make, a small portion of that will actually go to Beyond the Darkness to keep us afloat. So that's a great way you can help and get the things that you were going to buy anyway. The best part is it costs you absolutely nothing more to add. Nothing more at all. It's just that simple. So go in there and bookmark it. Go to Killer Links at podcast1.com. Click on Killer Links. Find the Beyond the Darkness banner. 
click on that, visit all of our advertisers, but all the stuff that you need and you buy on a weekly and monthly basis from Amazon.com, just click that link there for Amazon and bookmark uh, the, the link so that that way you've got it and it's always easily accept, acceptable, um, accessible rather, and then uh, make that available to you so that you can help us continue our broadcasts here on Podcast One. And like I said, while you're there, make sure you check out all of our great advertisers because there are some fantastic advertisers with some great product. As a matter of fact, one of our brand new sponsors on the show is HelloFresh. I'm familiar with HelloFresh because I've been using them and they want to change the way people eat forever. They believe that everybody deserves an honest, natural, delicious, healthy meal. And uh, they celebrate fresh ingredients. They make magic in the kitchen. And believe me, that's something because I am not a cook. I am I can barely open up a can of SpaghettiOs without messing that up. But they've made it even better. And I was a little intimidated at first, like most of you. You're, you're afraid to try all these new things and cook because you don't have the background. You don't have the experience. Well, whether you're a professional or a large family or just brand new at this, they have everything that you need to make it easier, tastier, and healthier than ever. Ever to enjoy the experience of cooking new recipes and eating together at home. You can do everything from creating the recipes and planning the meals to grocery shopping and even delivering all the pre-measured ingredients. That's what HelloFresh delivers right to your door so you can skip the trip. How about that? They offer uh, customers a classic box or the veggie box, and they're going to be launching a family box. Customers can order three, four, or five different meals per week designed for either two or four people, and new recipes are created every week. I got my first box, and I was I was intimidated. I'm not going to lie. I was intimidated because I'm just not a very good cook. But I popped it open, and I followed their step-by-step instructions. My meal was done in 30 minutes. They're some of the best meals I've ever eaten, definitely the best meals I've ever cooked. And the kids thought that I brought home uh, takeout and just put it on a fancy plate to eat. They didn't believe that I actually made this meal. And HelloFresh is the meal kit delivery system that makes cooking fun, easy, and convenient. And each week, HelloFresh will create new delicious recipes. Their step-by-step instructions to take around, like I said, 30 minutes, I think is the longest it's taken me to uh, cook one of these meals and they source all the freshest ingredients measured to the exact quantities needed so there's never any food waste there's never any guesswork which is what i was afraid of and uh, they employ a full-time registered dietitian on staff who reviews every recipe and makes sure that it's nutritionally balanced so if you're like me and you don't know you know i want to make something for the kids i want to make a big meal for the family that's going to be balanced it's not just macaroni and cheese and chicken nuggets yet again They've got all of the answers for you. All of this delivered to your doorstep in a special insulated box, and they do it for free that way. It's uh, it's phenomenal. It's made my life a lot easier. Tim is just starting on it as well, and I know he's going to love it as much as I have, so I encourage you to check it out. Um, here's what you want to do. There's a unique promo code. It's called Darkness. Real hard to remember. I know. You're listening to Beyond the Darkness. The promo code for this is Darkness. And for $35 off your first week of deliveries, just visit HelloFresh.com. That's HelloFresh.com. And enter Darkness when you subscribe. It's that easy. And I promise you, you're going to thank me because it has never been easier to make a good, healthy, happy meal for you and your family. And HelloFresh is making it even easier than it's ever been before. So again, remember, go visit HelloFresh.com. Use promo code DARKNESS and start your new adventure into eating healthy and being in a much better place. That's what I'm doing. That's what Tim's doing. We encourage you to join us. And that's a great way to support the advertisers right here on our show as well. And again, we're talking tonight with Neil Story, and his book is The Little Book of Death. You can get it on Amazon.com. Make sure you use that Killer Links logo, uh, or the banner, and then click on the uh, Beyond the Darkness banner so that you can go order it through us. And that way, not only does Neil get a sale, you get the book you're looking for, and it goes to help out our show. It's that simple. The Little Book of Death. We were talking about um, grave robbers there in the last segment and some of the bizarre rituals that go into uh, grave robbing, what kind of bodies they look for. One thing that I was really surprised to find uh, before we kind of launch into some of these other weird rituals, Neil, was the fact that there is a very famous grave robber that a lot of people don't know. Um, and I guess he, he wasn't necessarily a grave robber, but may have been employing a few grave robbers to work for him. Benjamin Franklin's house in London 
when they were excavating and, and refurbishing it, they, they cut up a bunch of uh, the floor, and underneath it they found what I believe was body parts of up to 160 people that had been buried under his home in London. Do you know, is this a fact or, or an urban legend that's been spread around? Well, London is an incredibly ancient city. It's got a history that goes back thousands of years. And people have been buried in London for thousands of years. And Ben Franklin's house is quite probably built near to one of those old graveyards. I haven't heard an awful lot of the details about uh, the discovery there. I don't know whether the bodies showed evidence of being wired as skeletons or being anatomized. This is normally uh, evinced by a skull being trepanned in that the skull, the top of the skull is, is, is cut off. Um, it's sometimes put back together and it would be wired together. They put hooks on the side of the, the skull. So it, it might well be that it, his house was built on, on, a, on an older graveyard. London is very fluid for such things. Uh, and, and you know that they'll sometimes sell an old graveyard so that it can, it can be developed. I'd like to tell you a little story. Sure, and just for people to look, it, you, it's not just me making this up, folks. If you go Google Ben Franklin's basement, you'll see mm. the, the photographs. They they said that it could have been Ben Franklin. It might have been a doctor that lived with him, but that there were definitely bodies that had been used for um, experiments. And because Ben Franklin was a doctor and he was involved in a lot of uh, uh very progressive ways, they said it wouldn't be so far removed to believe that one of our founding fathers here in the United States may have actually employed grave robbers to help him uh, expand his horizons in the scientific realm and try to figure out answers to these things. So go look. They, they've actually they've cut a hole in the floor, and it's now covered in plexiglass. So you can actually look down at the body parts that are still underneath Ben Franklin's house, although you bring up a great point. Could it have been just a mass burial ground that yeah. they found there? Um, you would think the stench would have been horrible to have bodies rotting underneath their house just in the basement. But, uh, again, it was a different time and a, a different era when people were yard, yelling Garde Lou and throwing poop and pee out the windows out of a bucket. So I guess anything could go at that time. Uh, well, it, it could well be that they were put into a, a lower cellar and you shut a door, and if, it, if it's ventilated, the smell goes elsewhere. Uh, you could put quick lime onto the bodies, I suppose. I mean, you'll know of some notorious uh, cases of murder all around the world where the murderers have hidden bodies underneath their houses. For example, John Wayne Gacy, right. who, you know, put the bodies uh, in, in the crawl space under his house. I'm not going to say Ben Franklin was a murderer. No, no way. No. Uh, a great man. And the point is that, you know, in the spirit of learning at that time, it was acceptable to use bodies to uh, and dissect them so they could well have been robbed. Absolutely. But it, 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 it wouldn't be unusual if you are working within that profession. You can only source bodies legitimately if they have been executed. And although execution was, was by hanging, it was public back in those days. You, you're not talking about the hundreds of bodies that would have been required to supply all of the teaching schools in Great Britain. So they had to find other ways. And people who were drowned, people who were washed up, they, they are all uh, liable to be used uh, for for dissection. So, yeah, they, they could well have been robbed graves. I think as well we, we, we are in danger sometimes of applying our modern values to the people of the past. And people did have very, very different attitudes back then. And, and you know, people could be seen as, you know, the, the body of a poor person in the grave. What What other use is it? So the body snatchers would, would do their business. And as long as people didn't know about it, see about it, out of sight, out of mind was acceptable back in those days. Thank goodness we have more enlightened times now. Yeah, no doubt. Um, Neil, famous celebrities, famous historian uh, or historical figures, I should say. Uh, mm. You know, I know Abraham Lincoln was the um, 
was on the list to have his body stolen at one point. Uh, I, I know the remains uh, of the cremains, I should say, the cremated remains of Groucho Marx were actually missing for a long time before they were found. Uh, I, I met somebody a year ago in Chicago who had uh, what they believed to be part of um, one of his bones and his one of his teeth from oh. Groucho Marx from that uh, urn after it had been stolen and the body parts go through the black market and such. But what a strange deal. The idea of stealing body parts from famous legends. I mean, I know that saints, um, the idea of, of carrying a hand of a saint or a finger or a body part into battle kind of was like an idea that it gave your your party strength. It gave your battlefront maybe the the fortitude to move forward as though the saint was leading you into this uh, battle. Saints, okay, maybe I, I understand that. It still seems very bizarre to me, but why the fascination with celebrity body parts? Well, with, with saints, you see, anciently, you know, up to the medieval period, before the dissolution, before the the Reformation in Great Britain, there were many instances of of saints, and of course across Europe, of saints being buried in cathedrals, and their skeletons would be placed into a special repository. It would normally be made out of stone, so beautifully carved, but with holes in it, so that you could place your hand through the hole and actually touch the bones of the saint. And it was seen as this was a, 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 a you'd go on pilgrimage to get there. If you were sick, you were lame. People were blind. People, even those that they believed were dead, but didn't appear to be corrupt. Uh, the bodies didn't corrupt. Well, that, well, that could well be that the person was actually deeply unconscious and they would be taken to these places and uh, touch the bones. And miraculously, they would appear to be brought back to life. So with that in mind, you know, unscrupulous folks could uh, rob graves or use a, a, a variety of the lesser known animal bones because people would know about the common animal bones. But things like bones from the uh, if you can have an animal with, with toes or if you go to a graveyard, get the toes out of, of buried bodies there. And they would have quite some currency in, in selling the those parts to those that wish to have a little casket that you would call a reliquy uh, where you would have i don't know the toe bone of saint jerome or, or the knuckle of saint barnabas and you'd carry it around with you very it's a, it's a very intriguing belief and in in some places uh, even the church w wasn't above uh, creating its own relics uh, in a number of churches where there are the heads of saints displayed, uh, you would arrange to see it. You would maybe pay some money to be able to hold the head and maybe, oh, you would notice that a tooth was wobbly and you would offer quite some considerable amount to the rector to purchase the tooth of the particular saint that you're holding in your hands or admiring at that time and after a bit of humming and hawing you may be able to strike quite a pricey deal with that man of god uh, and it you know the rector or the cleric would sell the, the tooth to you uh, next thing you know uh, the, when everybody's gone home, the rector or whoever is nipping out from the church into the graveyard where there's a skull and another tooth would be procured and placed in the socket uh, that had been left where the tooth had just been sold. <laughs> oh, holy men. What are you doing? Look at it. Everybody's got an angle, Neil. Everybody's got a, a sly on the angle trying to figure out a way to turn a buck <laughs> selling Fake saint teeth. That's crazy. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and a lot of churches, you know, if you consider all across Europe and Great Britain, some would claim to have uh, the, uh, the bones of a saint. You know, St. Nicholas, for example, uh, the man that's you know, given us Father Christmas St. Nick. His bones, you'll find, were supposedly held in a number of different places. The complete skeleton has supposedly been in a number of different churches. May I mention the Holy Prepuce? Certainly, you already have. Now I can't stop you. 
good. Well, well <laughs> that is the circumcised foreskin of Jesus Christ. What? Uh, Yes, uh, the Holy Prepuce, it's one of the earliest recorded sightings of it, was on the 25th of December, 800, when Charlemagne gave it to Pope Leo III at his coronation. But as time passed, a number of religious houses claimed ownership, and indeed as many as 18 locations across Europe claimed to have the Holy Foreskin in the Middle Ages. The arguments about this raged until 1900, when the Holy Roman Catholic Church resolved the dilemma by ruling that anyone thenceforward writing or speaking of the Holy Prepuce would be excommunicated. Oh. (laughs) What? Why would they... Why would they have thought, you know what, we be- Mary, we better keep this foreskin because this could be worth a few bucks down the road. How, hey. how, how did that even come into somebody's uh, possession to begin with? Hey, well, they're, they're very enterprising, these people. You know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That is uh, – that's something. Boy, I mean, you people will collect the- anything, won't they? Well, you think about the number of nails that are, are displayed in churches and venerated as one of the nails that were used to crucify Christ. You know, I mean, and right. talking of Mary, for example, the Holy Mother's milk was widely displayed in a variety of religious houses across Great Britain and Europe in the Middle Ages, often displayed in a file. Um, it would be uh, on display and, and certain times of the year, the file would be tilted and it would be seen to liquefy and become milk like again. Wow. No, that's thought for the day. P.T. Yeah. Barnum, yeah, P.T. Barnum was right. There's a sucker born every day, isn't there? <laughs> Holy cow. That is uh, unbelievable. Smoke and mirrors, smells and bells. Yes. Oh, good <laughs> grief. Body parts uh, being sold and, and traded. Now, I know that you've you've talked about uh, a, a lot of different weird things, but let's start talking about other famous body parts. Uh, I know you've got a couple of famous heads that have been out there. What, what, who, who and why? What, what are the purpose of having Oliver Cromwell's head or Sir Walter Raleigh's head? Well, Cromwell's head is, is one of my favorite stories. After his death in 1658, the, the Oliver Cromwell, he was the man, you know, he, he led the, 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 the forces uh, in, in the English Civil War. He became the Lord Protector. Uh, he was, in effect, the, you know, the, he, he took the role of the king that had been executed. You know, he was the he ran the Commonwealth in so many many ways. And after his death, he was buried in Westminster Abbey. Well, when Charles the Second, the son of Charles the First, the man that Cromwell had seen executed, he wasn't very pleased. And so he actually dug up Cromwell. And he also dug up uh, two other dead Cromwellians, uh, Henry Ireton and John Bradshaw. They were dragged through the streets on hurdles, taken to Tyburn, where they were hanged, drawn and quartered. And then their heads were placed on display on spikes. And Cromwell's head was placed up there on Westminster Hall. And it sat up there for a number of years until one night it was blown down. Now, this is a significant head of history. Right. And so the sentry on duty, he squibbled it away. And he, he hid it and until in the days of coffee houses in London. Now, coffee houses were a great place to meet. I mean, I'm sure we all enjoy a nice coffee or you know, meeting with friends. Yeah, it's still pretty big here in the United States. Well, we, we, we love a coffee here, but the coffee house was something very special. It was quite expensive, and it was very club-like, and people used to love to ha- draw people in by showing the curious and the strange. And so Cromwell's head was pl- put on display in one of these coffee houses. And so you might imagine that there were a host of weird and wonderful things from a bat wing to uh, maybe Cromwell's hat in another. Um, they may have a dragon's egg, dragon's blood, curiosities and tribal art from the world that's being explored, you know, in the 17th and 18th centuries. And then all of a sudden, 
two heads of Cromwell turn up in London. And they're both on display in coffee houses. Mm. And, of course, a dispute arises, you know, which is the original, the real, real Cromwell's head. And so they get the two together. They're both on a spike. Uh, and they then get Cromwell's hat from the old, and it's got a lovely provenance with it, the old hat. And they try it on, and on the one with the big imposing head, yes, that's Cromwell's head, that's his hat, it still fits. And in those days, there was still plenty of skin on the head, and you could even see some of his ginger beard and even oh, spot his wart. Grief. Oh, yeah. The other head was considerably smaller, and so uh, shown up as as not being the, the authentic, you know, head of, of the executed Cromwell. It was then put on display in the coffee house as Cromwell's head when he was a boy. <laughs> Well, that worked out well. So, so this the coffee houses back then were the equivalent of the Hard Rock cafes and Planet Hollywoods of today. They would have oh, yes. all of these weird uh, oddity things to come see. And you know, I think I've seen Forrest Gump's one and only uniform and costume at about four different uh, <laughs> Hard Rock, or I'm sorry, at uh, four different Planet Hollywoods and at a couple of the Bubba Gump shrimp uh, factories. So it's pretty intriguing that. Uh, that they've been doing this through time and tide, and it, it just continues to be a successful way to draw people into business. The- and everybody wants to see it. Everybody wants to see those things to 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 know that is the only one. I mean, maybe in, in when it comes down to costumes, you've got to have four or five different costumes, you know, in case it gets soiled or they've got to have an action sequence. So sometimes, you know, there will be more than one of those. But if we're talking about Cromwell's head, there, there's only ever going to be one of those properly and authentic ones anyway. Let's, and, let's, you know, yeah, go ahead. For, for years after the closure of the coffee house, it was kept in the family of the, Wil- the Wilkinson family. And Canon Wilkinson, who lived in Woodbridge in Suffolk, used to go to parties wearing his, his clerical cape. And as he entered the door, he would produce Cromwell's head on its spike as his sort of calling card. Ha, ha, ha. But in later life, he thought that that was rather disrespectful to the Lord Protector. And so the head was returned to Cromwell's old university, his old college in Cambridge, Sydney, Sussex, where it is said to rest today in a location, the exact location, only known by a couple of the masters at the college. Are there ghost stories associated with these pieces and parts? Do people ever see the spirit of Cromwell? Would they uh, talk about that at the time? Or did it always just seem to be, uh, you know, kind of disassociated? As you mentioned earlier, in a lot of the graveyards, there really doesn't seem to be the amount of ghosts we would assume there would be. There's, you know, usually one or two famous ghosts in a in a graveyard. But how about the case with stealing body parts? You would think that's desecration. That's That would be something that would certainly bring up the ire of the spirit world. Yes. Well, body parts don't seem to, it's not commonly associated with a, say, a vengeful ghost trying to get the, the part returned to, to their body. In the case of Cromwell, the body parts are not haunted, uh, to my knowledge anyway. But his death mask, which uh, is in a number of museums, often has uh, a spooky sensation associated with it. Uh, indeed, in my study, I have a death mask of, of Oliver Cromwell. There he is looking very, he, had a, he was a very imposing man, a very big man, but he looks very, very peaceful and i've never felt anything too eerie off that but where in ely in cromwell house where he he lived um that is most certainly haunted uh, by the man himself footsteps heavy spurs jangling and even a full manifestation of the man himself now the when it comes down to body part hauntings, I suppose the most famous of all that I know of are associated with William Corder. Now, in the 19th century, the early 19th century, one of the most infamous murders was that of the Red Barn, committed by William Corder, who murdered a young young girl of the village who was a bit of a bit of a gal by the name of Maria or Maria Martin, and she was buried under the dirt in uh, the Red Barn. 
her body, she was thought to be missing. Had she gone to London with Corda? You know, that Corda's courting new, new women around the place. And it came in, in a dream to her mother that uh, she was actually buried in the barn. And her elderly dad, who was a mole catcher, went through the barn with his mole spike and he found the body of tragic Maria buried there and she showed, showed signs that she had been shot. Corder was put on trial, found guilty and hanged at Bury St. Edmund's jail in front of a crowd of thousands. There was a massive interest in his execution. In fact, in those days, they would even sell the execution ropes to the highest bidder. But when you've got a sensational case like that, the rope is sold at a guinea an inch. And it's said that by the time the executioner had sold all his inches of rope to hang William Corder, the rope would have stretched from one end of Bury St. Edmund's marketplace <laughs> to the other. <laughs> but when, when it details, comes... Details, details, Neil, come on. Absolutely. All right. And when it when it comes down to the physician that anatomized the body of, of Corder, he wanted to have some souvenirs. And so he took off Corder's scalp, including his ear, and which is, I've actually held it in my hand years and years ago. Uh, it's on display at Moises Hall. You can't handle it now unless you wear white gloves and have a special appointment, a reason to touch it. But years ago, the, uh, the curator would, would be keen, if you showed a genuine interest, to say, hold this. Uh, and it, it was the, the scalp of Corder, ear, sideburn, uh, everything intact, very black, looking rather like a deflated football. Then there was the book, and it was Curtis's account of the trial and execution of Corda that uh, the doctor had bound in Corda's skin. What? And that book, yeah, that's the skin was, was tanned after the execution. It was flayed from the body, tanned. And the book, Curtis's account, and the book is also in Moyes's Hall. Um, the skeleton of the anatomized body of William Corder was put on display in the West Suffolk Hospital for many years. Uh, and in fact, it was once in a glass case in the entrance hall. And if you approached it, uh, there was a trigger in the floor. And there was a spring-loaded device that caused the skeletal hand of Corder to raise and point to the donations box as you entered the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> what a bizarre but world we live in. The curious twist to the tale is that one of the doctors there, one of the surgeons, had a macabre collection of the unusual, the strange and the criminal. And he thought to himself, the head of Corder. Now, I could take that skull and replace it with a n other skull, and I would have the head of this infamous murderer in my study at home. Well, he did that. He replaced it, so no one really would notice the difference. But from that time forward, he was never comfortable. He was never a well man. His health went into a rapid decline. And to a few people, he believed that he was being pursued by someone that when he looked behind them, they would flit away. Now, it could be put down to a guilty conscience. Who knows? But when he died, it was passed to another doctor that had coveted that skull. And it, the doctor had it. He was a, a GP in his surgery, and he had it on a shelf. And he also became ill. Mm. And he wouldn't, uh, wouldn't countenance that it could be anything associated with the skull. But then he started seeing someone. And the person would disappear pretty quickly, but... They would just melt away, disappear into a wall or whatever. And eventually he died before his time. Some people even say he took his life through the fear of being pursued by whoever, perhaps the ghost of William Corder. And so those that were 
knowledgeable of his fear and not knew that he believed that Corder had been pursuing him to the grave, quite literally, took the skull and placed it in A.N. Churchyard. That That's never been released where it's supposed to be, but buried in consecrated ground. A friendly vicar said a few words over it. And now at least part of Corder was in consecrated ground. He could rest in peace. And the ghost of William Corder rests to this day. We think that red barn ghost that that along with the green briar ghost here in the United States is one of the weirdest ghost stories in, you know, on the other side of it, you look at it right here. You've got a, a woman that her the man in her life might be abusing, might have killed. There's some suspicion. There's some suggestion. This woman goes missing, yeah. and Mr. Quarter is supposedly sending messages from all over that they're here, they're there, but she has no interest in communicating with her family, whom she'd been mm. very close with, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then all of a sudden, uh, the mom starts getting these visions and dreams that the daughter's coming to her and says, you know, I was to meet him in this barn, and this is where I am. And sure enough, they found her. And uh, mm. it's a fascinating story. I recommend our listeners uh, read about the the Red Barn Ghost and the Green. Are you familiar with the Greenbrier Ghost? Tell me more about it. it it's another very similar situation where this um, woman was uh, uh, murdered by her husband, and he was very protective of her, very uh, controlling of everything she did. And when she died, she was supposedly pregnant. When she died, they. Uh, rush the the funeral the wake he wouldn't let any family member get too close to the body but they noticed Ooh. that there was like a, a ribbon or a scarf that had been tied around her neck and things just seemed off now i think much like the the red barn ghost the greenbrier ghost's mom may have had an idea of the fact that there was some nefarious action going on and that their daughter was you know murdered so she uh, uh, allegedly went to the police and said that she had had this vision her daughter came to her and said he threw her down a flight of stairs breaking her neck and sure enough when they did check her neck had been broken and it was murder so that goes down and in today in the in the world right now you can go see the green briar ghost there's a sign in the um uh, cemetery and in the town that says we are the home of the only ghost that ever helped solve their own crime and a ghost that was allowed to uh, its story be admissible in a court of law. Mm. So it's fascinating, weird stories like that that I love to get my, my motor running. But read about the Greenbrier ghost or the Red Barn ghost and, and you'll see there are a lot of uh, unusual similarities. But I, I often wonder if it was really the supernatural involved or just really attuned mothers that knew better than the stories that they were being fed. Uh, listen, I've got to mention something is we're, we're kind of bandying back between American stories and, and British stories on this. There's a story I know you've got, but I, I want to lead into that with this. I, you know, I'm a, a huge fan of the roaring twenties, the thirties. I, I really loved learning about the gangsters of that era. Yes. One of the big ones in the United States was John Dillinger, who of oh, course yes. was shot just outside the biograph theater. And I had the opportunity a number of years ago. I, gosh, it's got to be. I guess probably close to 30 years ago now that I got to investigate the Biograph Theater with uh, Richard Crow, the famous uh, ghost hunter and, and researcher in Chicago, along with a few friends. Wow. We got to be there on the anniversary of his death where his ghost was often seen sitting in his seat in the uh, um, Biograph Theater and people would come in to usher them out and he would just vanish. He had uh, tried to escape and, and of course had, had been shot just outside against a telephone pole. And there's a famous photograph that became just as big of part of the legend. And that is the legend of John Dillinger's penis. Uh, and this uh, is funny because if you see them wheeling him out on the cot, there's this large, what appears to be erection um, underneath the sheet as they're wheeling him away. And talk about macabre. Uh, people were dipping their their handkerchiefs in the blood or or dollar bills in his blood as he was laying there dying because they wanted a piece of this legendary Robin Hood-like villain uh, in the Chicagoland area. So well, that, it just goes to show nothing changes. No, people nothing. People want to be part of it. They want those souvenirs. Right. In the same way people dip their handkerchiefs into the blood of the aristocrats during the executions uh, during the terror in France. It is. It's so bizarre. People want to be a part of that. And people have gone and dug out bullets from the uh, the, the telephone pole. And some of the police officers back at that time had told us, yeah, on occasion we'll come out and we'll shoot at the, the telephone pole. 
<laughs> and, and leave new leave new souvenirs. But the the funny part was that supposedly this legend then grew, pardon the pun, about John Dillinger's penis, and that it was so large in stature that they ended up removing it, and it is now like at the University of Loyola in Chicago. Uh, kind of in a pickling jar. Of course, you know that that turns into more of an urban legend of sorts, and there's been no mm. no um, proof of that. However, it was debunked in the fact that the the large bulge underneath his sheet was his hat. They had thrown his hat on his lap and then threw the sheet up over him. Oh. And where it was positioned gave this very strange and ill placed uh, illusion, if you will. But you've got mm. a story regarding Napoleon. Oh, well, yes. I mean, there were, there were two stories that involve uh, members uh, that I know of that are quite significant. But yes, Napoleon's penis uh, seems to have been a fixation. That was my uh, punk band name back in the 80s. <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> well, I mean, people, they've been fixed on it since the, his doctor, for whatever reason, uh, allegedly removed it during his autopsy. On, on, on the body of Napoleon in 1821 in Corsica. Now, the penis was not properly preserved, and it went on display in Manhattan in 1927. Well, I wonder if Dillinger went to see that. Was he dead by 27? I, I'd have to look it up again. I think he died yeah. in the early 30s, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Well, you never know. <laughs> now, Time magazine... Uh, described uh, the, the Napoleon member as looking akin to a maltreated strip of buckskin shoelace. <laughs> wow, they are so poetic in the way they describe it. Eloquence. <laughs> uh, now, it was first put up for auction at Christie's, the London auctioneers, in 1972. Okay. Uh, the, the member was observed to be approximately one inch long. Wow. And was listed as a small, dried-up object. Now, apparently, it didn't make its reserve. Okay. And it was purchased a few years later by a New Jersey urologist for the grand sum of $3,800. And after his death, his daughter inherited the shriveled member, and she claims to have received offers in excess of 100000 thousand dollars for napoleon's willy a <laughs> hundred thousand dollars for the penis of napoleon what it's uh, a piece of the man yeah but that's i don't know people are weird people are so weird i don't get the whole idea of of why they would do that and you could find it folks i just googled it and sure as hell it pops up there's a a photograph of a <laughs> shadow boxed penis with some uh looks like paperwork uh, the, to prove that it was Napoleon's. I mean, how do... <laughs> I know. Oh, good, good grief. I, Maybe I it's a piece of pork crackling or something that somebody's put, put in there. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what you'd make, you'd wonder, right? I mean, obviously there has to be something to the provenance if they're able to prove that this is where it came from. Mm, absolutely. Um, weird. So now you said that there are a few stories surrounding members that have been removed and kept? No, oh, absolutely. I mean, possibly even more notorious is, is the member of Grigory Rasputin, sure. um, famous in pre-revolution Russia. And much gossip was attached to his influence in the court of the Tsar, notably his influence over the Tsarverich Alexei and the boy's mother, Tsarina Alexandra. Now, Rasputin was murdered in December 1916, and according to an account given by Rasputin's daughter Maria, they attacked the mystic after unsuccessfully poisoning him with food and wine laced with arsenic. Yusupov fired a shot at Rasputin's head, but only wounded him. He fired again and again, but the mystic was seen to struggle to get up. The assassins then clubbed him to the ground, and the nobleman pulled out a dagger and castrated him, flinging the severed penis across the room. The body was wrapped and dumped in a cart pit in the river, and the dead body was recovered a few days later. Now, one of Yusupov's servants recovered the severed organ mm -hmm. and handed it over to a maid who had been one of Rasputin's lovers. And she, in turn, fled with it to Paris. Of course. And this... <laughs> 
Oh, it is, it you, is the city of romance. As you do. <laughs> and there she kept it uh-huh. in a fleshed wooden box. Uh-huh. And the, the historical record states right. that this member was 18 inches long. Holy cow, and that's flaccid? Uh, I got it well dead. <laughs> uh, on, uh, and she kept it on top of her bedroom bureau. All right. Boy, talk it, about having some anxiety performance issues if you're the next lover of that woman. Hey, you know, I, but, you, know you, got, you know that that's hanging over your head, literally. <laughs> yes. It, it gives a whole new meaning to open the box, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it certainly does. <laughs> now, apparently, in 2004, right. it was claimed that Rasputin's penis was on display at the first Russian Museum of Erotica in St. Petersburg. Right. Now, at the institution... Uh, it, it, it claims that he bought the, the, the item from a French antiquarian for $8,000. Uh, and the member turned up in 1999 when a small box containing some mummified, hairy, shrunken object was found in an abandoned house in, the Parisian, in a Parisian suburb. And, um, well, it was sold, and, and it, it by that time was recorded as being 12 inches in length. Well, it must have been cold. Well, it must have been. <laughs> but apparently it has been painstakingly rehydrated <laughs> and restored, right. and is now displayed in preservation of fluid in a gra- glass specimen jar. However, rumor still persists that the whole affair may be a clever hoax. I was just waiting for you to tell me that you've also had your hand on that at some point, but I'm glad that you you, you can say you stuck with just the scalp of a murderer instead of the penis of Rasputin. That, uh, that would change the way I talk to you. I'm sorry, Neil, honestly. Well, the discovery would point me to make crude jokes like having a tip-off and all sorts. Oh, I, I'm not sure go for that. Oh you wow! You know what? You can you can age men to the age of forties, and you just can't take the teenage idiot out of us, can you, Neil? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know those of us that love the pursuit of the strange, the macabre, and the unusual have to have that child of wonder within us. And often we do talk of some very serious subjects, right. but there is light. In darkness, too. And, you know, Lord Byron said that uh, truth is strange, stranger than fiction. And you couldn't write this stuff. And we have uh, we've barely scratched the surface of this book. We've just talked about some of the more bizarre and fascinating aspects I found interesting. There's so much more to get involved in and, and pick up a copy of the book. It's The Little Book of Death. And while you're there at Amazon.com, check Neil Story, S-T-O-R-E-Y. You'll find all the information about him there and uh, all of the books, written over 40 books, some of our absolute favorites, and we've featured them here on Darkness Radio and Beyond the Darkness. Before we go, though, Neil, I have to uh, get you to regale us with a few of your favorite and some of the most unusual ghost stories. If you could at least give us two of those before we say goodnight, I know I would appreciate it, and so would our listeners. And you've done this for a while. You've collected stories from all over. And if we're talking about the little book of death, we have to talk about some of the more bizarre uh, supernatural tales you've collected as well. So with that said, Mr. Story, please let us know what two of your favorites have been. Two of my favorite stories are ones that are not widely known, or parts of the story are told in hushed tones, uh, particularly in East Anglia, in this, in the case of our first story. I have spoken uh, to the members of the, uh, it's, it's a manor house. The manor house still exists, although it is no longer in the family in question's hands. Uh, That family does exist, and out of deference to them and their assistance with me uh, clarifying the authenticity of this story, I will not be naming that family. But if you come on our tour, I may allude to it, and you can do you can do the math when I show you a few things when you come on the tour. 
Anyway. And with that said, let's mention, Neil is going to be our historian and our tour master when we go for the British Invasion this September 2017. I believe we're going to be launching on uh, Dece- on uh, September 24th. We'll arrive in England 25th. We begin our journey. And we've got uh, stops with Jack the Ripper, Haunted Castles, Hogwarts along the way, uh, Dracula Tales. We've got, um, uh, oh gosh, uh, eating possibly in, in the Titanic sister ship's dining room. We've just so many weird, cool aspects of this trip, plus a visit to Nottingham. Uh, you're going to want to be a part of this, and we'll, we're going to have information up very soon at darknessevents.com, darknessevents.com, or you can email me, dave at darknessradio.com. That's dave at darknessradio.com, and as soon as that information is available, I'll make sure we get that out to you because you do not want to miss a week with Neil and I as we tour England hearing some of the most historic and haunted locations uh, that they have to offer. All right, we'll let you go back into your story now, Mr. Story. Where will we begin? We will begin in the early 19th century. It's in East Anglia. And in fact, it's in the county of Norfolk. It's a large country house and a young man that has inherited that at a precociously early age. He's got an awful lot of money sloshing around and all he wants to do is make more money. And he doesn't really care who he hurts or what he does to get it. He is truly debauched. He is a vile character. But he, as a lot of these bad men do, does have a certain je ne sais quoi that ladies find quite attractive. And he courts a girl who is rather plain and ordinary, but she comes with a huge dowry of money. And he weds her, and he more or less installs her in the country house, forbids her to go out, because he is embarrassed to be seen with her. He spends the majority of his time in London, in the gaming houses. He is uh, whoring, he's going to cockfights and bear pits, drinking and carousing. The poor woman is beside herself. She is lonely and sad and she she would love to have a, a family and she eats for comfort and she eats and, and she puts on quite some considerable amount of weight and that makes her even more sad and it's terrible and it, he slays into her for putting her uh, putting the weight on he always argues with her. He resents any time that he has to have back at the the house because he sees her. And one night he decides that he's going to kill her, which he does by strangulation, manual strangulation with his hands. He then wraps her up in a sheet and he drags her down to the lake on the estate. He then uh, decides to, to weight uh, the sheet down and so that it will sink to the bottom of that lake. As he, do, as he does so, he's putting the stones in. Her hand falls out of the cover and he notices, of course, he bought her some very expensive rings, engagement ring, a wedding ring, rings that were gifts. And being the man that he is, he was not going to send those rings down to the bottom of the lake. He gets the majority of them off, but not the wedding ring and engagement ring. Her fingers are are, are larger than when they uh, met, first of all. Um, and so he can't pull, pull the rings off. And so he decides, what am I going to do? Uh, and so he he literally bites through one of the the, the joints on the fingers Ooh. and pulls and he pulls the ring off of, of of her engagement and wedding ring finger, and then pushes the body into the lake, and he goes down to London, and over the next days and weeks and months, he professes that she has run away, that she she's you know she's a rotten woman, she's run away with another man. In seven years, he's able to get the marriage annulled. He gets all of her money, and very soon he courts an, a, a very beautiful and a very nice lady who he really didn't deserve, but she does her best to make the best of him. 
And so they have uh, parties and gatherings. And the biggest party was one for his significant birthday. He, he was 30 years old. And they gather around uh, uh, all of their friends, the best of friends, the, the, the influential people. And during the height of the party, there is a knock at the rear door uh, n- near the kitchen, in the hallway near the kitchen. And uh, there is an elderly person there begging for money. Now, the lady of the house had always said that we w- they would accept beggars and take them into the kitchen and give them food and sustenance, not money, and send them on their way. And so they brought the old beggar in wizened rags into the kitchen, sat them down, and they, they were offered food. And the person seemed to be awkward, distressed, and really felt that they, they, they were owed some money or owed something. And so they inveigled the servants to take them into the great hall where the party was taking place. Now, of course, people that behind closed doors couldn't give two hoots about the poor in front of all of their influential friends would like to be seen showing the largesse, the gift of charity. And so this person approaches the master of the house and holds out their hand to receive the small bag of money that they were going to, he was going to magnanimously place into their hand. And he looks at the hand and there he sees the engagement ring finger is missing. And that all that is there is a raw stump, as raw as the day he bit through that finger to take the rings off his wife that he thought he had murdered. Underneath all of those rags, he gazed into a face, a face he knew to be her. He was instantly struck down, his face a mask of terror, his eyes standing out like marbles. He collapsed to the floor and died instantly. People gathered round in a absolute terror. Oh, my goodness, what could have happened? And when they looked around to see what had happened to the mysterious beggar, she was nowhere to be found. All right, that just goes to show you, folks, don't be biting off fingers. Don't be burying people <laughs> you think you got dead. Oh, man. you got to love these ones. And It's funny to me how many ghost stories are kind of on a revenge bent, right? It's... Uh, yes, almost a moral clause to the story when you realize what uh, what has happened. There's a cause and effect and that uh, he had this moment. Very chilling. All right. One more uh, time for one more story, Neil, and we'll let you go for the evening. What have you got for us next? Have I ever told you about a ghost that I investigated myself? I investigated when I was at college. I don't think I've heard about that one. No, I was at college in the town of Great Yarmouth in the 1980s and there were a few of us that were quite interested in ghosts and we would go to historic sites you know and they were open to the public and have a an, you know an interesting visit there see if we could sense anything photographing got to remember this is when we were using photographic film rather than digital that can sometimes produce those orbs we were getting orbs back in the day and and, and light anomalies strange stuff but you know we were teenagers there was an element of fun and adventure to it and one day I was in the college library. One of the girls from, they were part of the, the hairdressing and beauty department. He came out to the library and said, you're part of that ghost club, aren't you? And I thought, oh, she's going to be pulling pulling my leg and taking the juice. And she said, no, no, genuinely, I, we've got a ghost in our house. And it turned out that they'd rented the parents, her, her and her friend, their parents had clubbed together and rented them a cheap little terraced house, little Victorian house, not far from the college. And they felt, for example, these little terraced houses have a front room and they have a rear room that used to be the, the sort of parlour. And often they're knocked through, so you end up with a dining area and a seating area. And you'll normally watch the television in the front room, and you'd have the, the light in the parlour 
the old parlour out. But when they were watching telly, they'd sometimes see a black something out of the corner of their eye pass behind them. And then in the downstairs bedroom, the girl that slept in there, particularly when she had her boyfriend over, of course, they weren't married, a young couple starting out together, um, they felt the intensity of somebody or something watching them. And they were in bed together, and that, that's not a nice feeling. One night, her, she and her boyfriend were making love, and she pushed the boyfriend off. She sensed that it, there's somebody in the room. And she looked towards the windows, and in front of the curtains was something she only described as being something blacker than black. So the street lights shone through the, the curtains, but there was a, a, a figure and she said it looked as if they were covered by a blanket. She said, you're going to think I'm mad here. It wasn't white. It was bl Everything was black. Maybe it was a cowled figure with a, with a hood. She laughed. Well, I said, well, look, we've got nothing on this weekend. And a few friends got, got together with a few bits out of the science department. We could borrow the, the oscilloscope so we'd get some idea of vibrations. And in those days... Do you remember when video recorders used to have a brick of a, of a video cassette uh, that would load into the side of it with a big right. clunk, Dave? Do you remember that? And we took the, the we were able to borrow the video equipment, set it up into the parlour there. We all crammed into the front room, and we tried to do this as best we could. You know, we, we put some controls across the doors thread. You know, we did it professionally. We were still just youngsters. We weren't professional ghost hunters. Right. There's no Ouija boards or anything like that involved. Just a group of youngsters seeing if there's going to be a ghost there. We've got a, a mercury thermometer. We, we, we've got the basics to try and do a good job of it. We've got cameras, too. We're trying to stay up through the night, so we rotate. And it's about oh, one, two o'clock in the morning. It's classic chime hours. I know that now. Um, and the place went cold. It was deathly cold, and we noticed that the mercury thermometer literally dropped by several degrees. It just dropped, and everything in the house reset itself. So it's the fridge, it's it's the, the, the VCR, uh, everything that was electrical there went back to reset. It was strange. It could have just been a power surge, but my goodness, uh, it, it certainly frightened us. Right. Then nothing else for the rest of the night. Just just normal, rotate sleep and blurry-eyed. There we are on Sunday morning, just leaving the house. And we shut the door, and it's on a, a Yale lock. So you have to bang the door. And as we bang the door, there was a inside the house, a thump. I thought, oh, blimey, what, what, what could that be? So we go into the hallway. My friend goes upstairs. I go into the, the, the lounge area there. And I'm sure we've all argued with, with friends or family. And when you walk in that room, you, 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 even if there's no word said, you, could, you sense the argument. We, we, we've all had that experience. And it felt like a pretty serious argument had been going on in that room. We wondered if the dressmaker's dummy, one of the girls had one from a fashion course, we thought maybe that had toppled over or something. That had not toppled over. There was nothing disturbed in there. But... As I was leaving, the door opened up flat onto the wall. It was one of those kind of fiberboard doors. You know, they have hard hardwood on either side, the fiber in the middle. I, I just thought, is there something behind the door? Maybe something's fallen over. Now, remembering we'd been in that room all night. We'd all left together. And stuck in the back of that door was a pair of scissors. Now that, Dave, is one of the most frightening experiences of my life. Did you invest in there it. again, or was that your one and done? I have to say, the girls were so terrified by what had happened in that instance that they ne they never really went into the house again. Certainly not not at night. They 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 term their parents terminated the rental agreement, and they never went back in. The postscript to the story was when I was working with great yarmouth museum a few years later we had a, a special exhibition about the old monasteries of great yarmouth and one of the burial grounds <laughs> 
of one of the monasteries, if we, we did an overlay of current Great Yarmouth, and that cemetery was way underneath the house where we spent our investigation. Creepy so maybe a, a vengeful and angry monk or the spirit or something was generated that night and we hope that that will never be generated again and, and upset the people in, 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 in that house now. We've never heard any more reports of, of anything there. Neil, how can people find more information about you and your books? Where can they go visit? Well, what I would say, have a look on Amazon and and, and in, enjoy the books there. Take them, enjoy them. If you're in the UK, I, I lecture all over the country. Uh, just just look out there and, and, and they will find me. And in the next 12 months, I'm redeveloping a brand new website and I'm sure that we'll, we'll have another show together, we'll have a good yarn and, and we'll be launching the, the Neil Story website and we can get on board there, have a chat. And if you really are dead keen, well, there are social media places where I'm sure that we, we, we can be friends. Uh, not, not hundreds and thousands of friends, but you want to tag along well you're, you're very welcome how's that sounds phenomenal we look forward to seeing you in september of 2017 on our british invasion tour when darkness radio descends on england along with about 20 to 30 of our listeners as we go through a haunted tour of the countryside the castles and more thank you well, for I'm being a part of the show with us it's, it's an absolute pleasure. And what I will say is that you will not be going to all of the standard sites. Yes, you'll be going to some of the classics, but I'll also be sharing some very special places that, that I know only too well. And uh, it's, it's really going to be a ghost investigation trip that's not a mass marketed thing. It's special. Uh, and I, I'm really looking forward to sharing some of those places and stories with the listeners. We're looking forward to it as well. You can email me for more information at dave at darknessradio.com or keep checking the website darknessevents.com for an update as soon as it's made available. We do have the uh, Belvoir Winery event up right now in Missouri. If you want to go investigate the Odd Fellows Asylum, the Belvoir Winery with myself, Chris Fleming, and Bill Chappell, We've got tickets available. It is one of the coolest and most haunted locations I've had a chance to visit. It's a huge building, lots of weird stories, and a lot of activity taking place. Go find all that information at darknessevents.com, and that's the best way to find out where you can see me or Tim throughout the year at different locations. That's it for this evening. Tomorrow, what you think may be a lot more dangerous than you thought before. Tulpas thought forms can we create the paranormal we'll talk with joshua p warren tomorrow on the best in paranormal talk radio for tim dennis i'm dave schrader special thanks to neil story you've been listening to beyond the darkness